Okay, today uh, we, were, we are going to talk about uh, um, inferential statistics again. Uh, yesterday we mentioned, we started mentioning uh, uh, everything related to standard error, confidence interval, uh, power analysis and the t-test. Today we are going to look at uh, uh, the, the most important uh, inferential statistical test, which is the ANOVA, uh, and also the linear regression. Um, and then at the, at the end, uh, we, are, uh, we are going to talk about uh, tests that you can perform if your data do not really follow a normal distribution, so if the assumption of normality is not met. Uh, and in this case, uh, I will talk about a little bit about non-parametric tests and uh, uh, GLM. Uh, so yeah, the first thing uh, for this uh, um, tutorial is to actually install a series of packages uh, which you are going to need for importing data. So for example, the package AgriDat has a series of, uh, of useful data set related to agriculture. Uh, so I will just install all those packages now using the R RStudio as we saw yesterday. Unfortunately, it takes a while, particularly on the VLE. Okay. So now that we have all the, the um, packages installed, we can load them either using uh, the code, so the um, function library, or again using the graphical user interface uh, on, uh, on RStudio. Uh, because I already have the code, I can just run those, uh, those two chunks and then load all the packages. Uh, but then again, if you, see, if you see on the other side, then uh, now all the packages are ticked, so you can, you can just go there and, and tick all those boxes. Uh, as I said, uh, the, um, the package AgriDat is particularly useful because it's a, it's, it's a collection of data sets. And all these data sets are related to agriculture somehow. Uh, and so there are a series of examples that you can use and a series of data sets that if, if you want, you can use for, uh, for playing around with, uh, with R. Uh, what I would like to show you today is this uh, lasrosas.corn data set, uh, which is corn yield uh, measurement in, uh, in Argentina. Uh, it's like uh, 3,400 observations, so it's a, it's a massive data set. Um, as you can see, I'm using again the, the, the function XTR to look at the structure of this data set. So again, it's, uh, it's around uh, 3,400 observations. And then we have nine variables. So we have yield, which is our, uh, our Y. Uh, so uh, the, the, the variable that we are interested in uh, in modeling, and then we have a series of explanatory variables. So we have uh, uh, nitrogen uh, level, we have topography, uh, and a series of other parameters. In, in these examples, in, in the examples I will, I will show today, we are focusing on the nitrogen. And please be aware that nitrogen is defined as two different variables. So we have the variable nitro, uh, which has nitrogen level in numerical values. Um, so in this case, we will do what we call the, a, a dose response analysis. And we also have nitrogen level uh, as categorical variable. So the, the variable NF actually has, is, is factor, so it's a categorical variable with six levels. So here are, they are the same nitrogen level, but they are um, coded in, in, in a categorical way. Okay, so. Uh, Performing an ANOVA in R is, is quite easy. I mean, uh, it's just um, there is a function called AOV, which stands for, for ANOVA, clearly. Uh, and the only thing you need to input in, into the function is the formula. So in this case, uh, it's just saying that I want to uh, model yield as a function of nitrogen, which is the variable NF, because clearly ANOVA is a specific type 
of linear modeling specifically designed for uh, uh, categorical uh, or factorial designs. Uh, so we are using the variable nf, and this is the uh, and then you uh, include the the name of the data sets you want you want to analyze, and you just run the analysis. So again, performing ANOVA is, is quite straightforward in R. And then we can use the function summary. Uh, I don't know if you remember, but we used the function summary at, uh, in the very first day to actually look at uh, descriptive statistics for a, a, a data frame. In R, there are a series of functions uh, that despite the fact that they, they have the same name, so they are the same function, they change behavior depending on the object you provide to the function. So if you provide to the function summary a data frame, the function summary will return uh, a series of descriptive statistics for each column of the data frame. However, if you provide to the function summary, li like in this case, an object coming from a linear model, it will provide a summary, the summary table of the ANOVA in this case. So for example, now, if I, if I show you the output, the output would be the ANOVA table. So you have the degrees of freedom, you have the sum of square, you have the mean square, you have the, the, the value of the F statistics, and then you also have the p-value. And in R, you also get uh, uh, these stars uh, that tell you what is the, the significant level you achieved in your, in your analysis. So in this case, this is a very uh, highly significant uh, um, p-value. So the, the, the main thing about uh, performing an ANOVA when you have uh, a series of groups uh, is that this p-value is uh, depending on an null hypothesis uh, which is for the what we call the, the omnibus ANOVA. ANOVA. So basically, this, the, the null hypothesis that is being tested in, in this method is that all the groups are the same. So if uh, some groups have uh, uh, significantly different uh, mean values compared to the other, it will return a significant p. However, that doesn't really mean that all uh, the, the, the groups, uh, so all your, uh, your nitrogen, are significantly different in terms of yield from all the other. If you want to have uh, an idea of uh, what are exactly the combination of groups that are significantly different from each other, then you need to run what is called a multiple comparison, which is, which is a Tukey's test. So in this case, we are, we are using the, the function Tukey uh, HSD. And again, we are providing a a confidence level, which again is the 95% the confidence uh, we, we, we want to test every time. So again, it, it goes back to what we discussed yesterday. And uh, this function will return uh, a large table uh, in which each combination of factors, each combination of groups is tested. And it, it will return a p-value for, uh, for each combination. So for example, the, the first one, two, three, for five lines, uh, in these five lines, uh, the, the group N0, which probably is the control, is compared with all the other. And, it, it, and, and as you can see, the, the p-value changes for, for each, uh, um, each uh, single comparison. And uh, as you can see, I mean, in terms of uh, differences, uh, the, the N0 is, is statistically different from all the other groups. But then if you move, for example, to uh, the combination N4, N5, then you can see that the p-value is not significant, which means that even though the, 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 the p-value for the, the entire ANOVA model is significant, you have groups that are not, are not different. So in this case, uh, the, the nitrogen you provided in level 4 is not different from the nitrogen provided in level 5. So And, and this is the way you obtain uh, the, the main results for the ANOVA, which is the p-value, because clearly you, you are interested in, uh, in analyzing your, your levels, your, your treatments, and you are interested in, uh, in finding out whether the, the treatments are different from each other. However, most of the time you are also interested in, uh, in looking at the, the, the raw values, so the, the mean values for, uh, for your analysis. And in this case, because it's a, it's a one-way ANOVA, the mean value, you, you could simply calculate those mean values Using, using the apply function. But then in, in more uh, uh, complex design, then you really need to, to have uh, 
um, to, to cut for, for you need to lead the model to compute the, the mean values because th this would be the marginal means computed the, by, by solving the model. The way to actually compute the mean values for each group is uh, with the function model tables and then uh, um, with the option means as a type because clearly there are two different things. One is the, is the mean value for each group and the other is the effect and we will see later what, what it means by effect uh, in, in, the, in the context of ANOVA. So in this case, as you can see, you have, uh, um, first of all, you have the grand mean, uh, which is the mean value for the all. So yeah, you have the, the grand mean, which is the mean value of the, the entire yield across all the, the groups, uh, and then you have individual mean values for each group. So you can, you can really see that there is uh, an increase in yield uh, if you increase uh, uh, the number of, of uh, the, the, the amount of nitrogen that you provide in the soil. And, uh, and clearly, because now you have a p-value for each individual comparison, then when you, rep when you are reporting your results, you can, you can plug this, this p-value uh, after this, this means. Uh, another thing you would, uh, you would notice in this table is that you have uh, um, the line called rep, and this provides uh, the number of replicates uh, for each treatment. Okay? Um, most of the time, when you are running an ANOVA, you want to run it uh, as a balanced design. So you want, the number, you want the number of replicates for each treatment to be the same. However, in some cases, uh, uh, because of uh, sometimes the the plants doesn't really follow, follow what you, you want them to do or, uh, or because of other constraints, uh, you cannot really do a balanced design. So for example, in this case, it's quite clear that this is not a balanced design because in some, for some groups you have uh, uh, 571 replicates and other uh, is, is more. So clearly this is not a balanced design. And uh, the way you handle unbalanced designs is by changing the way you compute the sum of squares. Okay, uh, so instead of uh, when we when we run the the function summary, uh, the sum of squares was uh, was computed uh, uh, using the default way, uh, which is called the type one sum of square. Uh, if you are if you know that you have an unbalanced design, then you need to compute the type three sum of squares. Uh, I've put in a link that explains a bit better what uh, what are the differences between the sum of squares. Uh, but for the time being, just so you know, if you have an unbalanced design, you need to run this line to compute the, the p-values and the sum of squares, which is the, the, the function ANOVA with a capital A. Uh, this function is included in the package CAR. And in this function, you can actually input as, a, uh, as an option the type of sum of squares you want to calculate. So in this case, we are computing a type 3 sum of squares. And the result would be slightly different compared to uh, the, the summary table uh, we created before. Again, the, the, the p-value doesn't really change, but the f-statistics, if you, if you go back, uh, before was 12.4. Uh, I mean, it's not a massive change because we have a, a huge number of data in this particular data set. Uh, but if, if the number of replicates are uh, lower, then, then it will change uh, substantially from type 1 to type 3. So you really need to be aware of, of this situation. And this is the link to actually see a uh, a PDF uh, on, on this, um, uh, this, this different type of sum of squares. As I said, that in, uh, for, for the ANOVA, sometimes you're just not, not really interested in, in knowing the, um, the, the, the mean values for each treatment, but you are interested in, in knowing the effects of the treatments. So again, you can run the, the, the same exact uh, uh, function, so model dot tables, but then simply um, in, the, in the function type, you can, you can input effects, uh, and this will provide you the, the effects uh, of, of each treatment. And in this case, you need to be aware that the effects are related to the grand mean. Okay? So every time you see a plus or a minus value, this is a minus or a plus compared to the grand mean. So if we, if we go back, uh, the grand mean was 69.8, and N3 is uh, not 0.5 more in terms of uh, yield, so in quintals per hectare, more than the grand mean. So again, if you, if you go back, the, the, um, the mean value was 70.34, which is uh, 
around 0.5 more than the grand mean. This is the, the, the standard way ANOVA uh, does uh, perform the analysis. Okay, so uh, before we go uh, ahead and we talk about linear regression, I would like to uh, go back a little bit to what we discussed yesterday in terms of effect size and power analysis. And in particular, I would like to focus on the differences between statistical and biological effect. Okay? Because sometimes uh, there's, uh, there's a lot of people that confuse uh, the meaning of the p-value uh, with the meaning of uh, uh, looking at uh, the, different, uh, the, the, um, the different mean values for each treatment. So the fact that you have uh, a, a p-value, and the p-value could be 0.05, it could be 0.001, or whatever. I mean, this only tells you that the two groups are different, okay? But they, it doesn't really tell you what is the, the amount of difference between those two groups, okay? So you may have... Uh, uh, you may have, uh, particularly for large experiment, you may have uh, an experiment that is so powerful that can detect very small differences between group, but those differences are not biologically significant. Okay, which which means that, for example, if you have, uh, if you are testing a pesticide and you go to the client and you say, okay, this pesticide has an effect, but the client actually uses this pesticide and the effect is is small and it doesn't really make any difference compared to what the client needs to change and spend for actually performing the analysis, uh, then the client will not be happy. And this is the difference between having a p-value and computing what is the, the actual impact of, uh, uh, of your treatments. And the, the, the way you to, you to calculate the impact of your treatment is to calculate the effect size. So the same thing we did yesterday, because the effect size will tell you exactly what is the difference in terms of uh, standard deviation between the, the, the treatments. So the two means are one standard deviation away, so it's a large effect, so we are happy to go to a client and say, okay, this, uh, this will, uh, will get back all the money you spent for this particular treatment in more yield. Or if it's a small effect, then you don't really care about going to a client because, it, I mean, even if you obtain a significant P, it doesn't really mean anything. The effect is not there, okay? So here I, create, uh, I created a small um, simulation uh, to actually show what we mean by, uh, by the di difference between statistical and biological effects. So again, uh, I'm, I'm again using the function R norm. And in this case, as you can see, I'm uh, uh, sampling uh, three different samples of size three from three different uh, uh, population with uh, mean value of uh, 5, 6, and, and 7. And uh, because the, the standard deviation is the same, so it's 2, each uh, population will, will, have, will be one standard deviation away. So the mean value will be one standard deviation away from the previous one. So in this case, we are talking about a large effect. This effect is something that you could see <coughs> uh, with, with the naked eye on the field, because you, you will see more, more yield on one, on one plot compared to another. Okay, so now we can use uh, the function expand grid uh, to uh, create a, a new data set, uh, and we are replicating, uh, let's say, three different treatments, uh, three times. Again, you don't really need to, to know exactly what, uh, what I mean with, with all this, this code. I just want you to, uh, to have a look at the final, uh, um, the final ANOVA table. Again, if you, if you want, uh, I, I, in, in, the, in the text, there's everything related to uh, the description of all this, uh, um, uh, all, all the, the, the code I, I presented here. So again, if you are, if you are uh, uh, performing uh, the ANOVA on those, those three samples, because the, the experiment was not powerful enough, because we, we just have a sample size of, of three, we don't really obtain, as you can see, we don't obtain a significant p-value. So the, the p-value is not significant, but we actually see that the effect uh, in terms of biology is large because the mean value are very different from each other, okay? So this is an example of uh, a large biological effect, but a non-existent statistical effect, okay? And, uh, and, and this is important because uh, it, it will tell you that clearly your experiment was not powerful enough, so you haven't designed the experiment properly, 
but we also it, it will give you a, a, an important information on, on the treatment itself because sometimes you don't really care whether the, the experiment was done successfully, particularly in commercial application, you just care that the, the, the effect is large. Okay? And uh, in this second example, we are doing exactly the, the, the opposite. So we are uh, sampling from three uh, normal distribution with very small differences. So we have uh, uh, the first one with a mean value of 5, the second one a mean value of 5.1, and the third one a mean value of 5.2. But we are, we are creating three samples with uh, a size of 7,000. So okay, we, this is a, a very large experiment. It's a very powerful experiment. And if we run this whole chunk of code, you will see that the, the, the p-value is very highly significant. Okay? So in this case, uh, if, you, if you go to a client and say, OK, these three treatments are very highly significantly different. The kind you say, OK, fantastic, so I need to buy treatment 3. Yes, he will buy treatment 3, but then the effect is not there, because the effect is very, is very small. Okay? So in this case, we are talking about a, a statistical, a very, highly, a very high uh, power of the analysis. So the, the statistical effect is there, but the biological effect is not there. So every time you want to present your results, you really need to show both of these effects. Because the p-value alone, it doesn't mean anything. You really need to, to show what are the mean values, confidence interval. If you want, you can calculate the effect size and show what are the, the, the average differences in terms of standard deviation between your treatments. Because otherwise, uh, uh, if, if particularly, again, if you, if you are working with uh, commercial clients, they, they would not be happy if you just present a p-value and then the treatment doesn't work. Again, um, as we saw yesterday, uh, one, one thing we could do once we have, uh, let's say, a pilot study or, we, we, for example, we, we, we saw that uh, despite the fact that, uh, that our treatments uh, have uh, a, a large biological effect, we don't, we don't actually see any significance in terms of p-value, uh, it probably means that, again, the experiment is not powerful enough. Uh, so we need to run, again, the power analysis to actually calculate the number of samples that we need to actually achieve uh, enough power and, and be able to provide not just the effect size but also the p-value. Uh, so again, what we, we can do is run a, a, a power analysis. And as yesterday, in this case, we already have some data because we have simulated those data. If you don't have data, uh, one, 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 one thing you can do is uh, use literature, so again use a, a medium effect size. This will give you a good indication of what is the, the number of samples that you need to, to use for your experiment. Uh, yesterday we ran a, a t-test, uh, a power analysis for a t-test. Uh, today we are, uh, I'll, I'll show you how to run a power analysis for the ANOVA. Uh, in this case, uh, uh, the, the function is a bit different, so it's power uh, pwr.anova.test. Um, and the, the syntax is again a bit different. So one of the issues uh, with effect size is that there are a series of indexes, unfortunately. So the, the statistical community is not really, uh, has not really standardized the way to calculate the effect size. So what I showed you yesterday, the, the Cohen's D, is the, the simplest way of calculating the effect size because it's, the, it's, it's a way that it's related to the data. So you can, when you have uh, an effect size of one, you know that the differences between mean is one standard deviation. If you have an effect, effect size of 0 0.5, you know that the differences are half a standard deviation. So it's really embedded in the data. So it's easy to interpret. However, there are other, unfortunately, other uh, type of effect size. Uh, for ANOVA, we have uh, the F. Uh, value, the eta square, and a series of other. Um, so again, you need to be aware of all these, these different types, uh, not for, for this particular course, but uh, if, you are doing, uh, if you are doing stuff with ANOVA, you need to know that there are uh, many ways of calculating the effect size, and there are all legitimate ways, you just need to understand what they mean. So for example, with this function, we don't need to provide the, the D. So we are not, you don't need to provide what we, we uh, computed yesterday, but it's a different way of calculating the effect size, is the F, and the F is simply 
the effect size, the cohen D divided by 2. So again, if the, the effect size is uh, not 0.5, we just divide it by 2 and f becomes 0 0.25. So in this case, uh, we just say, OK, we have uh, three groups, because uh, we, we had uh, treatment 1, 2, and 3 in, in these examples. Uh, we just assume that we don't have uh, any information about, uh, uh, about our effect size, so we just assume a medium effect size, which is a d of 0 0.5, so an f of 0 0.25. Significant level, again, is the alpha, so it's 5%, and the power is 80%. And then again, if we run this analysis, you will see that the number of samples, uh, it would be around 53 for each group. So again, I input, uh, I input again the, the, the way to compute the, the actual effect size from our samples, uh, because in this case, uh, we, we have uh, a way to actually compute this effect size. And uh, as you can see, the effect size for the, the second simulation is 0 0.05, which means that uh, the three treatments, uh, or, or in particular treatment uh, uh, four, 5 and 4, they have a different, uh, the difference in mean value of uh, uh, 0 0.4 times standard deviation. So I mean, they are very similar, because we, we simulated uh, uh, those, those two as, as very similar. Uh, and again, if you want, if you, have, if you have a pilot study and you want to, to power your experiment based on, on your pilot study, you just use uh, the effect size com computed by your pilot study and you input it in, uh, in the power analysis. So in this case, I just, I just input uh, F as uh, ES, which is the, 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 um, uh, the, the, the effect size I just calculated, and I just input it here. And in this case, in order to have enough power to actually see, see those small changes, I would need uh, uh, 7,800 samples for each group. So clearly, it would be a massive experiment, and, and probably would not be uh, something that you run uh, uh, in, a, in a lab or, or in a field. It's, it's, it's just too much. Um, another thing you can do with power analysis, uh, as I said yesterday, what, what we just did is called the a priori power analysis. Because usually you are running a power analysis finalized to obtaining the number of samples before you run the experiment. Because you want the experiment to be powerful enough to show significance. However, in, in some cases, for example, if you, have, if you don't have many samples, you don't obtain a significant P, but you actually see that uh, the effect size is, is biologically important, maybe you want to run a, 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 what is called the a posteriori power analysis. So you run the power analysis after you perform the experiment. And this will, will tell you what is the, the, the power you achieved. And if that was too low, then you need to increase the number of samples. In this case, the, the function is exactly the same. However, as you can see, the difference is that here we are not included the, the option power, because power is what we want to obtain out of the function. But we are including the option n equal 3 which is the number of samples we included in, uh, in, the first, uh, um, in the first simulation. So in this case, assuming that uh, we have uh, an average uh, effect size uh, and we have three samples, uh, let's see what, uh, what was the power of that experiment. Uh, and the power was uh, extremely low. So clearly, I mean, in this case, when you, when you see s such a result, you know that uh, the, the design was not uh, uh, you, you, you haven't designed the, the experiment in a good way, so you need to go back and, uh, and rerun the entire thing with more samples. So the, the previous example was a, what we call a one-way ANOVA. So in that case, you, had, you just have one explanatory variable, so a series of treatments. Uh, and, uh, and in that case, uh, the, the the, the function just took a, a, a simple equation with yield as a function of nitrogen. However, in some cases, in many cases, when you design an experiment, you want to design a more complex experiment. You want to test more than one treatment. So in that case, we are talking about uh, the, the k-way ANOVA, which can be a two-way, a three-way, or whatever. It depends on uh, how many treatments level you have. So example, for example, yesterday, 
uh, we saw um, a, a, an experimental design with uh, treatment A, B, and C, and then le again level 1 and 2, and then plus and minus. So in that case, it would be a three-way ANOVA because you have a, 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 a three levels of treatments. And the way you uh, perform the analysis is just by including more terms into the equation. So in this case, uh, we want to include uh, not just the, um, the, the nitrogen levels, but also this other factor which is related to the topography of uh, the area. So in this case, you just add the plus sign, and then you include uh, the, the variable topo. So it's, it, again, it's very simple in terms of syntax. And in terms of what you can obtain out of it, again, it's, uh, it's the same thing we, we saw before. So we get a p-value for uh, uh, treatment NF and a p-value for, for topo. So this would be the, the two omnibus uh, um, ANOVAs for both treatments. And then again, if you run the, the, the function model dot tables, you obtain the, the, um, the mean values for both uh, treatments. For multiple comparison, it's a bit more, uh, let's say, complex. Uh, the, the syntax changes a little bit compared to uh, what we've done before, because now you need to specify uh, what is uh, the, the treatment you are looking to, uh, to, to do the for, for, for the multiple comparison. So in this case, uh, uh, we need to input the function which and say that we are only interested in the multiple comparison for the variable topography. So we are not really interested in, in getting out uh, the results for the variable uh, nitrogen, but also for uh, only for the variable topo. Clearly, you can include both. It's not really a problem. It, it's just the way um, it's just a way to, to uh, constrain the results to just what you are, what you are interested in. But the result will be exactly the same. So again, it will do a, um, a individual contrast. So it will it will do a series of uh, of uh, small, let's say smaller ANOVAs for each of, of the treatments uh, you have in your, uh, in your data set. So it will compare uh, uh, different topography level or, uh, or nitrogen uh, if you are interested in nitrogens. If you include uh, a plus sign in uh, the equation, what you are saying to R is to run a model that just looks at the main effects. So it's the, the model is just looking at the effect of nitrogen as, as a whole and the effect of topogra topography as a different factor. It's not looking at their interaction. Okay? If you want to look at the interaction between the different levels, so in this case, in the interaction between the nitrogen level and the topography, you need to include the star sign. In this case, what, if you include this uh, formula, what you are telling the model is to, comp to use um, the main effects, so compute a p-value for uh, uh, nitrogen, compute a p-value for topography, but also include a p-value for their interaction. So again, in terms of syntax, it's extremely simple. And in terms of what you get out of it, Again, it's, it's not that different. It's you get uh, a p-value for the main effect of nitrogen, a p-value for the main effect of topography, and then you get a p-value for the interaction, which in this case, as you can see, is not significant, which means that there is no interaction between nitrogen and topography. And again, if you, if you run the model tables, in this case, it will give you three different outputs. So it will give you the... the um, um, mean values for each uh, nitrogen level, the mean value for each topography uh, group, and then mean values for each combination of the two. And then you, you will be able to see what are the differences uh, uh, with topography between different levels. The, the fact that there's no interaction means that, for example, in this case, uh, if, you, if you check uh, the, the differences uh, for each uh, column, in, in terms of nitrogen, you will see that uh, from N0 to N5, uh, there is always uh, a sort of linear increase. Okay? And the linear increase is more or less similar uh, for each uh, uh, topography level. And the fact that uh, the, the increase doesn't really change with topography, this is a good indication that there's no interaction between the two. Interaction simply means that, uh, for example, in this case, if you have uh, a topography 
um, let's say the, the HT topography, I don't really remember what it means. Uh, if there was an interaction, you would see differences. So for example, you, in, you will see, um, let's say, a, a, a higher increase with, uh, with nitrogen or a decrease. Sometimes uh, you will see the opposite effect uh, because of, of the interaction. So you have uh, more yield on one side and uh, less yield, despite the fact you are, you are introducing nitrogen to the system on another side of, of the field. The fact that you still see, so for example, in HT you, you get lower, uh, lower yield, but you still, you still get this increment. So you still get from N0 to N2 uh, to N1, you get uh, an increase in yield, and then an increase again with N2, an increase again. So again, you, you are seeing this linear increase, um, even though the, 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 the amount of yield is different for the topography. And this is a good indication that there's no interaction. Um, here, I will not uh, actually discuss this in detail, uh, because I, I put some uh, PDF in there. But basically, um, it's important in R to uh, really understand uh, the syntax of the formula. Uh, as we saw here, there are, uh, for example, here, the, we already saw the difference between uh, including just the main effect with the plus sign or the interaction between, with the stars. Sometimes uh, when you have uh, complex data sets and you have more than two or three treatments, you may be interested in including uh, uh, pairwise interaction instead of uh, in interaction between all the treatments because they, they may not uh, make much sense. So in that case, uh, you will use this syntax in the formula. So you will include uh, the three treatments with the plus sign, but then you will include the, in, in, in the, 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 the two is a sort of, of power two. And in, in, in this case, it will mean to R to actually use uh, uh, the main effect uh, and just uh, uh, two-way interactions, okay? But then again, uh, you, can, you can have a look at the PDF in, uh, attached to, to, to know more about this. So now I will talk about, uh, because clearly what we, we, we've done now is uh, uh, we assumed that uh, the, the design of the experiment was a complete randomized design. So there were no blocks, there were no uh, all plots and split plot, etc. However, sometimes, uh, because uh, the block design is again very popular, sometimes you have blocks. So sometimes you need to run uh, your experiment uh, using a, a, a syntax suitable for a block design. Uh, and for this particular experiment, we are going to use a, a different data set, again from the, the, uh, the package AgriDAT, which is uh, a simpler data set. In this case, uh, uh, the blocking factor is the column uh, name col for columns. Um, again, it depends on uh, the, the way they, they, they input the, the variables, so it doesn't really matter for, for us. What it does matter is that you need to include the blocking factor in the formula. Okay? And the blocking factor is the first element in the formula when you are doing uh, an ANOVA for, for blocks. Okay? So in this case, the only difference is that before we include the treatment, we also include the blocking factor in, in the formula. But in terms of other differences, again, we just change the name of the data set. We clearly change the, the formula because of the, the different names in the data set. But the, the, the way you use the, the, um, uh, the code is exactly the same. And again, th this will tell you that uh, there is a, a significant differences between blocks uh, and there is a significant difference between, uh, between factors. For a split plot, uh, this is a bit more complex, okay? Because uh, as we said yesterday, and I have an image here uh, from uh, the from a split plot uh, available in, in a paper that are included uh, in, um, uh, as, as a link. So for split plots, uh, as I said yesterday, this is a, a, a nested design. So you have blocks, uh, and within each block you have whole plots with one treatment, and then subplot with a different treatment. So clearly you need to 
specify when you are doing an ANOVA for split plot that there are these three different levels and uh, each level will provide, um, will may provide uh, some error uh, or some bias to the model. So you need to specify to, to tell R that uh, you have uh, this, this sort of, uh, of uh, nested design. So here I, I show you the, what is what we intend for block, what we intend for all plot, and then subplot. And uh, the way to um, do the analysis, so here uh, what I did, I included uh, um, it's experiment3.csv. You have the data set on, uh, on the learning hub, uh, and this data set was taken directly from a paper, uh, a very recent paper, uh, which is called Analysis of Variance in Soil Research. It was uh, um, presented on the Environmental uh, the European Journal uh, uh, of Soil Science. Um, so I just take in this, this, uh, this, this CSV from, uh, uh, from the, 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 the content they provide with this article. Uh, I, I, so again, uh, the, the CSV is available on the Learning Hub. So if you want, you can just download it, uh, put it in your folder, and then uh, do the, the uh, set the working directory and just import it. Uh, however, I also included the, the, the file on, on my GitHub. Uh, however, for the GitHub, you need to include the URL. Uh, so in this case, I, there is a package for actually included URL and downloading data directly from the internet, which is called rcurl. And once we have the package, then we can uh, uh, run these other three lines. So we, we include the, the package RC URL. We get the URL from my GitHub. And then we, uh, we read the, the CSV directly from, from, from the internet, uh, which is very handy because there are a, a lot of data sets that are available online. So this data set, uh, if, you, if, you, uh, if you just take a look at it uh, on uh, on R Studio, so if we just look at the syntax, as you see, we have uh, a series of columns. We have the column blocks, the column whole plot, split plot, irrigation manure, and respiration rate. So respiration rate is our dependent variable. Uh, so we, what we want to uh, to model, irrigation and manure are do the, the two treatments, and then blocks, whole plot, and split plot are the the, the, the three different levels of the nested design. So uh, as you can see, each of these uh, uh, columns uh, were imported as integers. So and when you see e, e int before the column, it means that, that, that R has imported those values as integers. The problem is that we, these are not really integers. We know that they are factors. So we need to convert uh, these columns into factors. And the way to do that is simply use uh, um, S factor or factor in this case, let's see if it works. Uh, so basically, we are simply converting each column a, in, as a factor. And uh, again, if you, if you look at, for example, the first line, this is again an, an, assignment, uh, an assignment call. So what we are saying to R is to first convert uh, the column uh, manures into a factor, and then overlay the new value to the same column. So the, if, if you run this, this column, the, the data frame will change. So again, if we, if we, look, if we look back to our studio, now you see that uh, the, the column has, has changed between integer and factors, because you are, you are, we are actually replacing the values in the data frame with the new values. And once we have that, uh, again, we can run uh, uh, the ANOVA uh, function. In this case, the way to include uh, whole plot and split plot in R is with the option error included directly in, uh, in the function. So again, you don't really need to, um, to understand everything. But this, this function is, uh, uh, is the standard way of analyzing split plot design in R. Uh, and, and the syntax is exactly the same. I, so I, I used the uh, whole plot and split plot for a reason, because you need to understand if you, if you planned a split plot design, you know what, uh, what is your uh, 
your whole plot and your, wh what is your split plot. So you know what to include uh, in, uh, uh, and re in this formula, replacing what we, we presented here. And again, the, the way uh, you interpret the result is exactly the same. So you get the p-value for, uh, for manure and the p-value for the, the interaction. But again, it's exactly the same as, uh, as we saw before. <laughs> so as I said before, um, ANOVA is simply a particular type of linear modeling that is specific for factorial designs. So when, once you have uh, uh, variables in factors or so different uh, levels of nitrogen, different level of a pesticide or whatever, then you run the ANOVA, you are still computing the, sort, the same statistics, so the sum of square, etc., that you would compute uh, in a linear regression or linear modeling, but you are using uh, a particular type of linear modeling. Um, however, there is also uh, a, a more general type of, of linear modeling, which is uh, the, the linear regression in R can be done with uh, the function LM. And this particular uh, function um, can be used with whatever type of variables. So for example, if you run the same exact uh, models we ran before, so yield as a function of uh, the variable NF, which was a categorical variable, you, you would obtain the exact same results of the ANOVA. Okay, they will be in a different format, but they will, they will be exactly the same because the two models are the same. However, the LM becomes uh, extremely useful where you have other combination of variables. So you have a combination of a factorial variable and continuous variable. In that case, we are talking about uh, the ANCOVA model. Or it may be extremely useful when you have just continuous variables. And in that case, uh, normally we, we, we do we, we call uh, this model, the DOS response model. So in this case, uh, um, my, as I mentioned before, this particular data set has two uh, columns related to nitrogen. One is was NF, which was categorical, with different values. Um, and the other is nitro, which again has the same exact data, but they are input in numerical uh, values, so you get uh, the exact amount of nitrogen included in each of those N0, N1, N2. So one thing you could do with the linear regression is trying to figure out what would be ye the yield for uh, um, amount of nitrogen that you haven't included in your, uh, uh, in your experiment. So let's say that uh, you, have, uh, uh, you have included 150 uh, tons of nitrogen and 200 tons of nitrogen. With linear regression, you can fit the model and you, you can figure out what would be yield, the yield for 170 tons of nitrogen. So values in between, because you are fitting a model that will allow you to estimate, so make prediction uh, on, on new levels of, uh, on new values of your, uh, of your variable. Uh, again, the, the, the in terms of syntax, uh, that there's not much changes, so the only thing you, you, you need to change is the, the function. So in this case, it's not the, the a, a O V, which stands for ANOVA, it's just LM, which stands for linear model. But the, the, the syntax is the same, so you need to include a, <coughs> a formula and then the name of your data set. And then again, you can, you can check the results with the function summary, because the function summary will adapt its output based on uh, uh, what you use as, as input. So as you can see here, uh, as I mentioned before, the output of uh, the, the a call to LM is a bit different compared to what we saw uh, before. Uh, so you get uh, uh, um, the, the call, so this is what, what you input uh, in, uh, uh, in the model, and you get uh, the residuals uh, in terms of minimum value, median, maximum, and then first and third quartile. Um, this is extremely important to check one of the, the main assumptions of linear modeling, which is the assumption of normality. A lot of people assume that normality is in the predictor, so you need to check the histogram of your, of your variable, in this case yield. But actually, the important point is that the, the uh, residuals are normally distributed. Because all the assumption, if the, the assumption of normality and the assumption of uh, equality of variances, they all apply to the error term. So the fact that R is showing you minimum, maximum, first, and third quartile will allow you to uh, 
uh, understand that more or less in this case, as you can see, the, the minimum is more or less similar to the maximum. The first quarter is more or less the opposite of the third quarter. It, it will allow you to, to say that more or less your uh, distribution of residual is normal. And then we will see later on how to do it uh, in, in, in a more uh, efficient way or quantitative way. But for the time being, that's, that's what you get. And then clearly, uh, you will get uh, an intercept because, of course, the, the, the um, equation of the linear model is a bit different compared to the equation of, uh, um, of the ANOVA. So if we scroll down uh, in the, uh, where we scroll up, actually, when we, we were talking about uh, uh, formulas. So here, here, here is the, uh, the main equation of the linear model. So the linear model, uh, when, when you are fitting a line, you are actually um, fitting this equation to model your, your y variable. So you have uh, the beta 0, which is the intercept of your line. So the value in which the line crosses um, the, 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 the y axis. So the value that the, the function will take if uh, uh, x is 0, so if you don't have uh, any, any nitrogen added to, in this case, to the model. And then you get a slope for the, the particular uh, variable. So in this case, you get a slope for the variable x. And this is the output you get in, uh, in R. So you get an output for, for nitrogen. And this tells you what would be yield in uh, quintals per hectare because yield in this particular uh, data set is measured in quintals per hectare uh, if there was no nitrogen added to the model. So you, you will still get 65, uh, 67, 66 quintals per hectare of nitrogen. And then the fact that the slope is 0 0.06, it means that uh, for each one additional unit, so one additional quintal per hectare you add in nitrogen, you get uh, an increase of, of yield of 0 0.06, again, quintals per hectare. So the, the slope tell you what, what would be the unit change in uh, your y variable if you, if you change your x variable by 1. Okay? So that's the meaning of the slope. So in, in this case, it will allow you to tell exactly that you get uh, 6 uh, kilos per hectare more for each unit of nitrogen you add to the system. And again, in this case, you can, you can actually use this to predict uh, what will be uh, the yield, for example, for 150 uh, quintals per hectare of, of nitrogen or tons per hectare. I don't remember what is the unit, because you just need to solve the equation. You just need to say, OK, what is the y for a, a, an intercept of uh, 65.84 times 0 0.06? Uh, no, plus 0 0.06 times 150, which is your x. You solve the model. Uh, you can do it manually, or you can use the predict function in, in R, and you just obtain your, uh, um, your prediction. So as I said before, there are a series of, uh, of assumptions for both ANOVA and linear modeling that are extremely important. Three, three main assumptions are extremely important. One is the assumption of independence. So all your samples need to be independent from each other. Uh, and this assumption is related to the way you design your experiment. Okay, if, you, if you randomize properly, the assumption of independence will be met. Um, the other two assumptions are the assumption of normality. So again, the residuals need to be normal. And the assumption of equality of variance. So again, the error term needs to have a, a mean of 0 and needs to have a, varia a constant variance across the range of fitted values. Okay? It may seem difficult to understand, but actually uh, R provided with a, a very useful graphical way to check uh, those, uh, those assumptions, which you can do by simply calling plot and including the, the object, uh, the output object of the linear model. So in this case, we are calling the plot for, uh, uh, for the linear object, and this will plot what we call the diagnostic plot for the model. Again, the, the, the function par is just a, a function that is useful when you want to include two plots on the same panel side by side. You can just use this function. I will not go into detail about the meaning because, again, it's, uh, 
uh, we do, just don't have time. Uh, but there are several ways you can do it. You can create grids of, of plots in R. It's not a problem. So basically, these are the main uh, the main plots uh, you get out uh, from um, from R, and these are the main one that you need to justify why your model is is a good model. So the first one is uh, the residuals against the fitted values. So fitted values are are your your um, your um, y values, so the, the values of uh, of um, yield, okay, and uh, the residuals are again the, the residuals of the model. So the difference between what the model computes and what is the actual observation for that particular level of nitrogen. What you are looking for in this plot is that the red line needs to be more or less uh, horizontal, crossing zero because the, the average value of your residuals needs to be zero. And you're also looking for the spread of this point to be more or less homogeneous. So you are not looking at uh, variance that increases with the fitted values. Uh, and for example, in this case, the fact that uh, you get uh, this sort of spread across the, the, the fitted values means that the model is good. Sometimes you get, uh, for example, a funnel shape, so the, this sort of uh, uh, the, the spread of the point increases or decreases. When you get this sort of funnel shape, then there is a problem with the model, and you need to one of the assumptions is not met. On the other side, you have the, the QQ plot. The QQ plot stands for quantile quantile plot. So, as we mentioned yesterday, quantiles are uh, ways to divide your distribution in a series of uh, of cut points. It could be hundred, it could be a thousand, a thousand points. It doesn't matter. Uh, in this particular plot uh, simply takes uh, the quantiles of the distribution of residuals and plot them <coughs> against the quantile of the standard random uh, the standard normal distribution which is a normal distribution with zero mean and standard deviation of 1 again uh, that what you are looking for in this particular plot uh, is that uh, all the points lie on on the on the 45 degree lines so there is per perfect correlation you are looking for perfect correlation between the two quantiles. So one thing you could, uh, um, you could notice is that clearly, I mean, this is not a line. This is sort of an S, an S shape. Um, it, it takes a bit of, of, of experience to actually understand that uh, we could accept uh, the assumption of normality in this case, even though we have uh, a sort of S shape, is not, is not a massive uh, uh, difference uh, in terms of, uh, of correlation. So we can accept, uh, in this case, I, I would accept the assumption <coughs> of normality. Uh, but then clearly, as I said, it takes a, 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 a bit of experience to actually be able to just eyeball a plot and say, OK, we can, we can accept it. Uh, so there is a, a quantitative way of, uh, of um, um, testing normality, which is computing the skewness of the distribution. Uh, and we can do it with the function skewness. <coughs> this is available in the package moments so we installed uh, at the very beginning. So um, again, clearly, this is a, um, these are two nested functions. So we have the function residuals, uh, which extracts the residual from the model, and then the function skewness uh, that computes uh, the, um, the skewness of the distribution of residuals. Again, you don't need really need to understand everything. Uh, it just so you know, it, you, you just need to, to uh, change the, the name of the, the model within this call, and, uh, and everything will be, uh, will be the same. Um, so if you, if you calculate the skewness, you see that uh, th this model has a 0 0.4 skewness. You accept normality if the skewness is below plus or minus 0 0.5, OK? So if it's below 0 0.5, it's a rule of thumb. It's not, I mean, it, it's written in literature, but it's a rule of thumb. It's, it's very practical. But if it's below 0 0.5, you can accept normality, no problem. So what happens if, if you cannot accept normality? What happens if your, if your data are very skewed, if, uh, if th th there's no way you can run a model? Or if you run a model and uh, you, you check the diagnostic plot, and the model doesn't really meet the assumption. What, what happens then? Well, there are uh, three different options. Okay, the first one is uh, uh, transforming your data. Okay, you can, uh, for example, log transform your data. 
you can uh, use a square root transformation, you can use whatever you like. I mean, I've, se I've seen uh, uh, log uh, 1 plus y, I've seen uh, um, fourth, uh, fourth root transformation. Uh, clearly, the, you, you can do whatever you like. As long as the model uh, fits the, the, the meets the criteria, uh, you can use whatever transformation you want. The only problem with transforming the data is that uh, the, 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 the parameter you compute, so the slope, will be transformed as well. So you will need to back transform those, uh, those slopes to be able to uh, do the same sort of interpretation we did. So clearly, when we did the, 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 the model interpretation, we say, OK, we have a 0 0.05, which means that for each unit change in nitrogen, you get an increase in yield of 0 0.05. If the model was transformed, that the slope would be transformed. So you would need to back transform the slope to be able to <coughs> interpret the model. The second option you have is to use non-parametric tests. Non-parametric tests, they are tests that do not assume normality. So what the, 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 the assumption of normality is not included in this model. So you could, you could run uh, non-parametric tests. Uh, Again, there are, there are a couple of, of examples. Uh, there, there are non-parametric tests for uh, um, the t-test, uh, the one-way ANOVA, which is the cross call Wallis, uh, and uh, uh, the Friedman test, which is not included here. It's available in GenStat. And that, wo that is for um, repeated measures ANOVA. Uh, the, the, the problem with uh, non-parametric uh, uh, tests uh, is that they don't really cover the full range of modeling uh, um, that the, that linear model covers. So if you have very complex uh, designs, uh, uh, the non-parametric test uh, they, you you will struggle a little bit. Um, in in um, in the code again, I will not run this because uh, we probably don't have time. Well, actually, I can I can just run it very quickly. I mean, the Kruskal wall is is, uh, is the the non-parametric alternative for the one-way ANOVA. So again, the only thing it, it will tell you is again the, the, the degrees of freedom and the p-value. So the way you interpret the, the results is the same. You just, you just need the p-value and say, OK, I run the, the non-parametric test because the, the, the assumption of uh, normality is not met, and, and this is the p-value. Um, in the package rfit, there is also another uh, function. It's called rov. And in, in this case, you can perform non-parametric ANOVAs for uh, uh, complex designs. Um, the only problem with this particular um, function is that it doesn't really work all the time. Uh, I had some issues because it's, uh, it's an experimental function, so I had some issues in the past, so be aware that uh, uh, if you have complex design, you can try with this function, but it, uh, um, sometimes it doesn't work. <laughs> but again, the, the, the output is exactly the same. It's called the robust ANOVA table. Uh, but again, you get the, the F statistic, you get the p-value, so the interpretation is exactly the same as what we saw for, for the normal ANOVA. The third option you have is using the generalized linear model. Generalized linear model, they are a particular type of, uh, of models that uh, do not assume uh, normality, uh, but they assume that the error terms follow different distributions. So the main difference between uh, uh, non-parametric tests and GLM is that with non-parametric tests, uh, the test does not assume normality, but you don't need to provide the, what is the actual distribution of your error term. The model simply doesn't care. With GLM, y the, the model does not assume normality, but you need to input the distribution that, uh, that, uh, is, uh, um, that, that your data follow. So for example, if I show you the distribution of, uh, of count data, uh, for, for count data, uh, we intend, for example, uh, if you go in the field and you measure the number of, of insects uh, or the number of events per hour, uh, these are, this will be all count data. Uh, counts, they generally do not follow a normal distribution because you have a lot of counts that are between maybe 0 and 1, 0, 0 and 5, or whatever. So they are very close to the origin. You cannot have negative values. So clearly, the, the assumption of normality is not really met for this particular distribution. This is called the, the Poisson distribution. Uh, and uh, the, the problem with 
using this distribution. And again, I, I've seen articles in which count data were transformed using the log one, uh, one plus y uh, transformation. So you can transform even, even count data. So there's a, the, the, you, you can use different types. You have a series of options. You don't really need to use GLM for count data. You have, you have your options. However, most of the time, for count data, you use GLM. And as I said, because you know that uh, uh, count data normally follow a Poisson distribution, within the GLM call, you need to input uh, the distribution that you think your data follow. Okay? And this is extremely important. One other uh, important parameter for, uh, uh, for GLM is the link function. Because clearly, we are, not, we are talking about uh, um, data that uh, do not follow a normal distribution, so they need to be transformed to be able to compute uh, and linearize the model. So the way uh, GLM sort of linearize the model, they use link function. So with uh, the, the, the Poisson regression, the link function is uh, the natural log of the data. So again, every, everything you, you get out of the model as will be will be transformed use the link function. So again, the, the, the are, these are the two major uh, features of GLM. One is the link function, and two is the distribution of the error term that needs to be input in, in the model. So let's look at the example here. Um, the example is with uh, with another data set available in uh, um, in, in the AgriDAT. So in this case, we are talking about uh, uh, counts of worm uh, in, in, in the field for, uh, for a beet field with a set of in insecticide treatments. So to get, again, what we are interested in, in looking at is uh, differences between treatments and number of worms. So probably a, a treatment will, be more, uh, will kill more worms, etc. So we want to see these sort of differences. But the fact that we have uh, uh, count data so that the, our data do not follow a normal distribution but the Poisson distribution um, clearly implies that we, we cannot use a linear model but we need to use a GLM and as you can see within the call after the function uh, after the formula after we included the data so again this first part is exactly the same as what we use for LM or ANOVA However, the, the, second one, the second part of the call is, is a bit different because here, as I said, we need to input first the family distribution, uh, the family of distribution for the error term, a second the link function. In theory, you can, uh, you can also include just Poisson. The link function will be, uh, by default, uh, the, the log function. But again, in this case, I just wanted to, uh, to show you the, field, the full uh, um, the full syntax. So ag again, we are including the, the, the distribution, the Poisson distribution, and the log link. In, in R, uh, log is uh, by default the natural log. It's not the base 10 one. So we just run the model, and then we can obtain the ANOVA table using the function ANOVA with a capital A within the package car. And uh, in terms of output, uh, uh, clearly, the, the, um, the tests is a bit different. We are not computing the F statistics as uh, with the ANOVA. Uh, we are calculating the log likelihood because everything with GLM is based on deviance. Uh, again, you, I included a series of, uh, of resources to know, know more about GLM if you want. Uh, but the, the output uh, is, can be interpreted in the same way. So in, in here, we are just uh, uh, interested in the, the p-value, <coughs> which again is, is very highly significant. And again, we can use the function summary uh, to obtain a summary table of our treatments. So in this case, uh, um, as I mentioned before, uh, these this treatments are categorical. Uh, so the, the way uh, GLM um, create the output is very similar to the LM call instead of the, the ANOVA call. Um, so for example, in this case, you get an intercept and you get treatment two, three, and four. So th the way you interpret this result is um, uh, it's basically uh, each of these levels of the treatment variable is compared to uh, the reference level. So if we 
take a look at the object uh, uh, bell, uh, what is it? Uh, here. So if we if we look, if we take a look at the at the um, at the data frame, uh, as you can see, the the variable treatment has four levels. Okay, from T1 to T4. Okay, so why is T1 not showing here? Because T1 is the reference level. So all the results that you can see here are related to the reference level. So for example, the minus 1.2 indicates that uh, uh, the level T2 has a lower number of worms compared to level T0, T1, which probably is the control. However, these slopes cannot be interpreted as we did for the, for the linear model because we have the log transformation. So we need to back transform all these, uh, uh, these slopes in order to interpret the model. And again, if you, so for example, here, this uh, particular p-value, so the, the p-value of T2 is related to the comparison between T1 and T2. Okay, so every time you get the p-value from the ANOVA table, which is again, it's the p-value for the model, but then the p-value in the summary table is related to individual comparison between treatments. So if you are interested in uh, uh, in the comparison between T2 and T1, T3 and T1, then you can just run this table. If you are interested in uh, different comparison, then you need to what is called re-level uh, your variable. So you need to change the reference level for the model to use for comparison. And you can use the function re-level uh, with the, the, the name of uh, the, the factorial variable and, and change the reference level. And again, if you look at, if you go back and look at this, uh, the table, as you can see here, now the, the factor starts with T4. And the fact that it starts with T4 means that now T4 is the reference level. So if we run the model again, T4 will be the one, uh, the one level not shown in the model. You see, now we have T2, T1, 2, and 3, which means that all the, the, the p-value will be referred to the comparison between T4 and all the other. So for example, the fact that this p-value is not significant, it means that uh, the comparison between T4 and T2 is not significant. So the two groups are not significantly different. Again, we can check the assumption by using the diagnostic plots. And the way to interpret this plot is exactly the same. So you want uh, the red line to be uh, on the 0. Uh, you want the, the spread of the points to be more or less homogeneous. And you want uh, the QQ plot to be, again, uh, more or less on, uh, on the, 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 the line of perfect fit, which is the, the, um, uh, the dashed line in the middle, the 45 degree lines. So again, here, it, uh, it's, uh, it, it's a bit, uh, it, probably I would reject this model because uh, it doesn't really look good, uh, particularly the, the QQ plot seems very skewed. And the fact that the error term as a, as a mean below zero will actually make me reject this model. Uh, and the way, I mean, probably we, we will see later on why uh, this model is not good. Uh, as, as I mentioned before, the way to interpret this model is a bit different uh, compared to linear model. And, and it is different because everything you get out in the summary table is uh, transformed with the, log, uh, the natural log transformation. So for example, if you want to know exactly what is the difference between uh, uh, T1 and T2, uh, so re refer back to the first table. So as I said, this, the minus uh, 1.02 is the, the slope calculated for the comparison between T1 and T2. But because this is, this is transform, we need to input the, uh, we need to calculate uh, um, um, we need to exponentiate this index. So back transform uh, the, the log transformation and compute the, the real difference between these two levels. So when we calculate the exponential of, of minus 1.2, we get 0 
And the interpretation is that T2 is uh, 0.35 times T1. So clearly it's lower, because if you, if you are computing the 0.35 from, for example, if you are, uh, uh, if you are saying that uh, T1 is 2, T2 would be 2 times 0.35. And that's why the, the, uh, the slope is negative, because the value of T2 is lower compared to T1. And it's around 70% lower in this case. So this is a note about how to interpret your results. Another thing you could do is to use the, the function uh, predict. And I will, uh, I will show you later on uh, how to do that. Uh, so now um, a, a, a quick note on over dispersion. So what we mean by over dispersion is uh, uh, that the, the variance of the distribution is larger compared to what we would expect from a Poisson distribution. Uh, as, um, so one of the, the features of the Poisson distribution is that the mean and the variance are, are equal. So the, if, you, if you calculate mean and variance of the distribution of counts, these two values should be the same. However, if, if we actually compute those, we see that uh, the mean is uh, 0 0.79 and uh, the variance is, is a bit higher. If the variance is higher, then we, we, we identify this phenomenon as, as over dispersion. So actually, this distribution is not really a Poisson distribution um, because of this over dispersion. However, in this case, this is not, uh, not a massive over dispersion, but there are cases in which the variance is much larger. So in this case, you need to, uh, in, in such cases, you need to, to use different functions and, and different uh, family of distributions. Uh, so normally, uh, the, the way you deal with over dispersion is to use different distributions. So one of the distributions could, could be the, the quasi-Poisson distribution. Uh, another one could be the, the negative binomial distribution. So the, the quasi-Poisson is included in as one of the distribution for GLM. So you can just run the same exact function uh, by, specifying, by specifying the, the quasi-Poisson family. Another function we could use for, if you, if you see that the variance is, is much higher compared to the mean, uh, using the quasi-Poisson probably doesn't really make any difference. So I would just go with the negative binomial, which can accommodate uh, larger variances. And the way to actually compute uh, GLM for the negative binomial is by using a, a function in the package mass, which is glm.nb. And as you can see, that the syntax is a bit um, is, is uh, uh, a bit different because clearly the, the fact that you are using this particular function uh, means that you don't, need to, you don't need to specify the family of distribution because the function knows that it's, it's you are using the negative binomial. But again, the, the way to um, do the model and interpret the result would be exactly the same. One thing you can notice here is that the, the, the p-value change a little bit. Because clearly, each model will be different from, from the previous one. Uh, and every time you fit uh, different models, uh, you really need to be sure you are, you are checking the assumption, you are checking the, the, the accuracy of the model, um, and, and, and be sure you, you try to fit the best one uh, available. All right, so um, count data is one of the type of data for which uh, uh, GLM are specifically designed. So there is uh, one family of distribution that can be used for, uh, for count data, which is the Poisson or the negative binomial, depending on the over dispersion. However, there are other types of data for which DL GLMs become extremely useful. Um, so for example, when, you, when we have binary data, so either 0, 1, presence or absence, uh, uh, or other binary outcomes. So for example, we, are, we will look at, uh, at a data set uh, that um, detected the presence of blights in potatoes. So it's just zero if there's no blight and one if, if there is blight. So it doesn't really produce uh, the, the amount of, uh, of disease. It's just zero or one. So it's presence or absence. In this case, uh, um, we are using again the, the GLM but uh, the, the main difference is that the, uh, the link function changes and also the, the, the family of distribution changes. So in this case, 
uh, to linearize the model, we are using the, the logic function, which is the, the, the one function shown here. So the probability of uh, x being uh, uh, 1, for example, so the probability of blights in this particular example, uh, divided by 1 minus the probability. And, and this is the, the log logic function. And uh, in terms of uh, a family of distribution, uh, uh, 0 and 1, they follow the, uh, what is called the Bernoulli distribution, which is a particular type of binomial distribution. So in the model, we will use the binomial distribution of data. So again, we are using the, a, a data set available in the package Agridat, uh, which, as I said, has a series of, uh, of uh, variables, so the, the amount of rain uh, in, uh, in January, the amount of rain from January to March, I think it was, and then the, the total precipitation. And then the, the, the variable we are interested in is blight, which is a binary uh, variable, so it's either 0 or 1. So the way to uh, run a, a, a logistic regression, because this is the, 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 the actual name of this model, is logistic regression, in, uh, in R is similar to what we used uh, before for, for count. So again, you are using the GLM. Uh, what, what changes is the family. So again, we are using the binomial uh, family of uh, distribution and uh, uh, the logic link function. However, the way to interpret the model uh, is exactly the same. So again, we are using the ANOVA function to see the p-value of uh, uh, this particular treatment, in this case uh, a, a continuous variable, so that this particular variable is, is important for the model. It provides a, a good input to explain uh, the, the changes between uh, having blights or not in the field. And then we can use the function summary um, to get the slope of the line. However, uh, as I mentioned before, the, the fact that we have uh, uh, this log link, uh, logic function, logic link, and uh, um, and the, the, the model is not really linear, uh, is, is uh, using the binomial distribution, uh, means that the interpretation of the model is, again, a bit more complicated. And it's even more complicated compared to what we saw before for counts. So the way to interpret your results, uh, because um, the, the the value you obtain here, um, these are not the probability. These are ra uh, odds. Okay? The, the way to, um, from these odds to obtain probability, you need, is, it, you need to solve uh, the logic link function. So basically, you need to back transform uh, the, your model. So again, the, 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 the equation using the intercept and the slope for. Uh, uh, your, uh, your, your value of x, so the value of, of rain. And then again, uh, this is the numerator, and the num and denominator is 1 plus the same thing. So again, you are solving the model, and you are exponentiating it. So in R, if you want to obtain, for example, the probability of uh, having blight in the field with a rain of 10 millimeters, you just need to solve the full model. Uh, so solve this, the, the equation you see here, and then you obtain a value of uh, 0.37, which is around 37% of, uh, of, uh, of uh, probability of having rain, uh, of having blight if you have a rain of 10 millimeters. Um, there's also a way to get the same output you get from linear models, so get uh, what would be the change in probability for unit changes of rain. Uh, but in this case, because we are, we are working with a sigmoid, because the, the, the logic link creates a sigmoid, we need to use a, a linear approximation. Uh, and, and again, this, this code shows you what, what would be more or less the, uh, the unit change in probability for each, uh, for each change in, in, uh, in range. So for example, in this case, for this part of the curve, you will get 10% more uh, probabilities for each one millimeter of rain, you get more in, in this particular period. So having said that, and this is the way to manually interpret your model, but having said that, um, because this is particularly complicated, there is actually no, uh, no good reason to do it manually. You can use the predict function. Okay? So for example, if you want to compare, uh, to create uh, the probability or extract the probability of uh, 
uh, getting blight for rain equal to 10 millimeters, you can simply use the predict function, include a, a new data frame with rain equal to 10 millimeters. The option is response. This is very important because response shows you the back transform probability and not uh, the, the odds. <coughs> and if you run this line, then you will see that you obtain exactly the same value of what we obtain manually. So clearly this is much, much easier compared to do everything manually. And if you want again to compare, to, to create uh, the, the probability for unit changes, you can just input a, a data frame with two values separated by one unit. And this will give you more or less uh, what would be the difference uh, between, uh, between those, two, those two probabilities, which is again around 10%. So lastly, what I would like to show you is uh, uh, the GLM for proportions, uh, because again, this may happen. So for example, if you are working with uh, uh, seeds uh, and uh, you have a data set uh, which shows you how many seeds actually germinated compared to a total, in that case, you are, we are talking about proportions. Uh, and uh, there is a particular type of, uh, of GLM uh, for, for a proportion. So uh, the, the, the last model I would like to, uh, to talk about is, is the GLM for proportion. So in this case, again, we are using a, a, a data set uh, available on AgriDAT. This data set, again, has a, a series of factors, so uh, extract the genetic, uh, uh, genetic type of the seed. Uh, but uh, the, the main focus of, of this particular experiment in, is in the valuable gem, germ, which stands for how many seeds germinated and n, which is the total number of seeds plotted in, in that particular subplot. In terms of syntax, uh, you, we are still using the binomial family for proportions. However, we need to use the, the C-bind, uh, a call to the, the C-bind function to actually calculate those proportions in R. But again, once you know how to, to do it, and, and in, within the C-bind, the first element uh, is the number of seeds that germinated, and, and the second one is the total number. So again, if this is it's the number of insects, is, again, it's the total, is the second element. The, the syntax will be exactly the same. And the way to uh, check uh, the, the, the p-value, again, is exactly the same. The function is the same, the ANOVA with a capital A in, the, in CAR and summary. Uh, in um, that again changes compared to, to the, uh, the, the, the input. So again, we, we get our p-values uh, that we can input in our report if, uh, if proportion is what we are using. And then again, if you want to obtain particular proportion for particular uh, data in, in your variables, so particular type of ge genetic or particular uh, uh, extract uh, for whatever it means, uh, there's no way to actually do some uh, complex math. You just use the predict function with the response, uh, type response, and then you'll get your proportions. Okay?